Well, hello, Nazarenes in quarantine, uh, hopefully for not much longer. Uh, we are hoping that May 31st on Pentecost Sunday we'll all be able to gather again. That's been our target date, and that's what we're shooting for. And hopefully that date won't move on us, but that's, that is uh, our target date, May 31st, to uh, start gathering together as a, as a family of faith. Well, today is, uh, you know, is a, if you don't know, I'm going to remind you, it's Mother's Day. So tell your mother you love her. Give her a virtual hug if she's a distance away from you. It's days like today that I wish that heaven had a Zoom account because I'd, I'd certainly uh, like to have a Zoom meeting with my mom and tell her I love her and maybe tattle on my brother Terry. I don't know. No, I'd, I'd brag on him and tell mom uh, how good he's doing. Well, not only is it Mother's Day, but we also know that this is the Lord's Day. This is the day that he has made, and we're going to rejoice and sing and be glad in it. Uh, speaking of sing singing, uh, Dave Whitman's coming uh, shortly to lead us in a time of singing. If, and if you're by yourself, if you're alone, why don't you just sing at the top of your lungs, or at least until your dog starts howling a little bit. And uh, if you're with others... Uh, I'd suggest maybe singing off key just to annoy them and, and put them to the test to see if they're putting into practice our message last Sunday on patience. No, I, I'm just kidding about that. Don't, don't do that, kids. But uh, it is Mother's Day, and so uh, we have a special message today, a great treat. We've done this for the last couple of years. We, we may be the only church, not only in North America, but in the entire world, that on Mother's Day, has a mother-daughter uh, pastoral team that brings uh, the bread of life. And you're going to appreciate and love the, min the teaching ministry of uh, pastors Dorothy and her daughter, Pastor Haley. Well, let's pause to invoke and invite the Lord's presence in our time of worship today. Well, Lord, we do worship you today in spirit and in truth. And so I pray that that each of us, wherever we are, uh, may sense the Spirit of God, rich and real, in our presence. And I pray that you'll, you'll come, Holy Spirit of God, and mold us and make us and shape us because we've been in your presence. Receive, Lord, the, 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 the songs of our heart, to, and I pray that it'll be a sweet sound in your ear today. And then bless the teaching of truth. I pray for Pastor Dorothy and Pastor Haley, as, as they together break the bread of life, may it nourish our souls and equip us to do your good work. I pray in the name of Jesus, the risen Savior, and God's people said, Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Sanctuary 
as I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace, and I can only bow down and say, you are awesome in this place, mighty God, you are awesome in this place, Abba Father. I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace, and I can only bow down and say, God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God.
Happy Mother's Day. I hope each of you moms out there are having a great day. It's probably going to be a little bit different than any Mother's Day that you've experienced, but hopefully you still feel loved and appreciated and honored today. In our text this morning, we are also going to find a mom. A mom in some ways like us who has found herself in a new normal. Go with me to the book of Ruth. If this isn't a book that you've read, I hope that you'll put that on your to-do list for this week to spend some time there. Lots of great application for us today. We find a mom, Naomi, and there has been a famine in the land that they have lived in. So Naomi and her husband and their two sons moved from Bethlehem, where they had been living for many years, to the country of Moab. Fast forward a little bit and we find a tragedy. Naomi's husband dies. Her two sons marry Moabite women, and after they've lived there about 10 years, both of Naomi's sons die. Naomi hears that things have gotten better back in her homeland, so her and her two daughter-in-laws load up and they are going to head back to Bethlehem. Somewhere along the way, Naomi has a change of heart and a change of mind. We're not sure exactly what happens, but I think part of it is the In the fashion of a true mom, she realizes that she's taking these two girls away from their families and from their land. She also may sense that she really doesn't have anything to offer them. Remember during this day, a woman really was dependent upon her parents or her husband to provide for her. And Naomi finds herself in a season where she doesn't have either. She's traveling back to her home. However, she has no idea how she might be received there. Also, Naomi is broken. Her husband has passed and both of her sons are gone. It's hard for us to imagine the kind of pain that she's living through. Somewhere along the journey, Naomi tells the girls, go back to your home. I have nothing to offer you. I am too old to find a husband. Even if I did, I won't have any more sons. I have no way to provide for you. Just go back home. There's a little bit of discussion, there's some tears, and then one daughter-in-law does decide to do as Naomi suggested and go back home. The other daughter-in-law, Ruth, pledges her her allegiance to Naomi and continues on this new adventure. Ruth makes a pact with her mother-in-law that is so endearing, such an example of a lifelong commitment that it's sometimes used during wedding vows. It's found in chapter one, verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Ruth was committed to her mother-in-law. There's so many things about this book of Ruth that apply to us even today, May 2020, in the midst of a pandemic. One verse especially seemed to jump out at us during this season where everything is just different. Anytime there's a change or a deviation from the norm, sometimes emotions run high. Even if you're not scared or panicked, you have to admit it is a new normal. We're navigating through days where it seems like our motto is, but we've never done it this way before. As people loved and chosen by God, it's important that we choose this season to wave his banner high, 
that we show his love to others. A virtue that seems to be such a clear reflection of God is kindness. Pastor Mark read the story last week about being kind, about being kind regardless of our situation, of our opinion, or of the circumstances. Just be kind. When Naomi was encouraging her daughter-in-laws to return to what she thought would be a better life for them, she used this phrase in chapter 1, verse 8. May the Lord show kindness to you. What a sweet prayer. What a powerful blessing. What a statement that we can cling to. We know that God desires to show kindness to us. And it's not a stretch for us to carry that one step further and say that he desires that we show kindness to others. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another. In Colossians 3.22, it tells us God's holy and chosen people to clothe ourselves with kindness. 2 Timothy 2.24 reminds us that God's servant must not be quarrelsome, but to be kind to everyone. God desires to be kind to us and for us to be kind to one another. So Ruth and Naomi were walking along the road, and when they got to the town where um, Naomi was from, all of the women and people came to the gates of the town because they were so excited to see her. They couldn't wait for her to get any closer and ran out to her. They were excited, but Naomi wasn't. She responded to them as they got excited for her and said that she had left full but the Lord had brought her home empty. Sometimes I think that. I think that my life was full. I had plans. I had sweet students and dinner reservations and a job that I loved going to every day. I had doctor's appointments that I wanted to keep moving forward with. I had a calendar that at least I had the opportunity to put things on. I was full, and I felt like I was brought home empty. People make me happy and give me energy. They make me feel worthy having interactions with my students and my coworkers and my friends and my sweet family in this church. That's what makes me feel worthy and gives me a purpose. Brought Me Home hits a little differently after the last 40 plus days, doesn't it? I don't know what your home looks like, but mine looks like dogs that don't have a schedule. So now these 100 pound animals also think there's no rules and my husband thinks that we need to be doing all of these things around the house, so he's trying to add things to my to-do list when I have lots of cross-stitch projects to get done. Maybe you feel a little empty today. Maybe you didn't realize, but maybe you also get some energy and some worth from other people like I do. Maybe you don't like not living life the way that you thought you would. Maybe you're struggling with the freedoms that you once had and Feel like maybe now because of something outside of your control that's been taken from you. Maybe you feel alone and a little broken and empty. Stick with me here because Naomi didn't end there. She didn't end empty. She didn't stay in her emptiness. She just continued to walk in kindness. She clung to the God of kindness and even wished kindness upon others. Even when she felt empty. Even though she was in a time where she felt empty and where nothing was how she had planned it, kind of like maybe how we are now, she continued to walk in kindness. Naomi prayed for Ruth and she said that she prayed that the Lord would show kindness to her. Naomi knew this God of kindness would continue to walk with them even in the times when they felt empty. She knew that he hadn't left them. Man, isn't this what we need today? Even when the Lord had brought her home empty, he was there with her. He brought her home empty, but he stayed there. She felt empty, but he knew her worth. He knew what she was capable of and that she could be entrusted with Ruth to walk her in kindness, just as he had taught her. The same kindness that God himself had shown Naomi, he never left her. He never left her. Even when she felt like he might have her, when she felt empty, he didn't. He didn't leave us when we came home empty. Life's not what we expected. And maybe you're worried, maybe you're scared, maybe you're just annoyed that your husband wants you to clean out a closet when you have a craft project. Maybe we're just living with the motto that we've never done this before. I spent a lot of my time upset about the changes to start with. The changes that I felt like were kind of forced on me that I wasn't expecting. I spent some days 
bickering with my husband because he was the only person that I saw every single minute of the day. And reading through this, I wonder how long Naomi was angry about the changes that were forced on her. I mean, her husband died. Both of her sons died. And then she was here with these two daughter-in-laws. And I'm just trying to clean out my closet in between my Pinterest fails. And she still walked in kindness. She still wished kindness upon those around her. Even when her whole world was taken from her, she was wishing kindness. What are you wishing? I'm wishing a lot of things. And sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not wishing kindness. Sometimes I'm so confused consumed by myself and my own emotions or my emptiness that I forget to look around me at the people that are also struggling. Sometimes I'm not walking in kindness. Sometimes people aren't meeting me at the gates of my town like they did Naomi because they're so excited to welcome home this kind person. Sometimes my emotions overtake my calling. But we know our calling. We know that we're called to kindness. We're called to kindness always, right? When we're full and our schedules are just how we want them to be. When we get to sit in a restaurant and eat a bowl of queso that someone refills every time we eat all of it. We're called to kindness then. We're called to kindness when things are easy, but we're also called to kindness when the Lord has brought us home empty. We're called to kindness when we have to work home with our spouse. When our kids want to eat lunch three times and dinner four times a day. We're called to kindness when we feel empty, when we feel alone, when we don't feel worthy. Naomi said, may the Lord show you kindness. So now, may the Lord show you kindness. Show you what it looks like coming from others and show you what it means to be lived out yourself. Even when we have come home empty, may the Lord show you kindness. We need to be kind during those times when all we do is glean. Some days, as Haley said, we do feel God's kindness shining on us. Days when things are going great, when we're making all the right choices, when the sun is shining, when our kids are rising and calling us blessed and your husband is singing your praises at the city gate. By the way, I think it's against all the laws of Christendom. Um, you have to speak on Mother's Day and at least reference Proverbs 31. So there it was right there. In the story of Ruth and Naomi, we find now to where they're settled. They have to have some kind of plan now for food. Naomi instructs Ruth to go to the field and glean. Some of you may be familiar with this term. We glean information from a book. We glean news from a news broadcast. We gather something that's useful. In this context and in the days of Naomi and Ruth, gleaning refers to something that happens in the field when there has been a harvest. Gleaning is a process in which the landowners had an obligation to leave some produce in the field, um, some grain, whatever they had been harvesting, in order to provide for the poor and the marginalized people. It wasn't an act of charity because it wasn't exactly their choice. It was more like a tax that was imposed on them that they had to do. The Hebrew word for glean means to collect or gather up or pick up, to gather slowly and laboriously bit by bit, to learn, discover, or find out, usually little by little or slowly. There seems to be a big difference between harvesting and gleaning. Also, even various degrees about the difference between being a landowner or a worker or a gleaner. Here are some things that I think Ruth might have benefited from gleaning. You don't always have to go big or go home. This is hard for us sometimes. We want to do our best. We want to be the leader. We want to own the fields, to reap the harvest. Or at the very least, we want to be a paid worker and have that title. We want to be essential. Few people say, oh yes, please, may I just glean? May I just laboriously, little by little, pick up your crumbs? No one says that, but sometimes we find ourselves in that spot. Maybe you're not always the favorite. Maybe you're not always the first choice. Maybe you don't always feel favored and productive. Maybe the people around you don't add to your sense of value or worth. Maybe today you would say, I'm really not that important. 
Maybe usually you do feel the opposite. Maybe you feel essential. Maybe you feel important. Maybe you feel productive. But during this interesting time, you feel less accomplished and less worthy. Here's a point that I caught myself making as I was thinking through this, and you may have already caught it. But notice how I connected worth with productivity. Why do we do that? Why am I more worthy when I'm harvesting and less worthy when I'm gleaning? Why am I more worthy if I'm at the top of my class or the favorite in my workplace or the one all my friends call when they want to do something fun? Now, I know all about using our talents and doing our best for God, and that's not what I'm talking about. However, if you're in a gleaning season like many of us are during this time, it doesn't mean that your worth is any less. You are worthy in the eyes of the great loving God who created you. It means you've just landed in a different season. You've landed in the midst where, for survival, you have to glean. You have to advance laboriously, little by little, in order to stay healthy. Hear me, you are worthy. The things that God says about you are still true. In the story of Zephaniah, we find the reminder of a God who loves us, who searches for us, and calls us worthy. Here's a portion of this from chapter 3. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Go ahead and stick your name in here. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Do not fear. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save you. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let that sink in just for a minute. The God of the universe, the God who created you, the God who causes the planets to spin around, the God who spoke and separated light from darkness. He is saying to you and he is saying to me, I take great delight in you. Whatever season you're in, however others around you may or may not define you, regardless of what you think of yourself, God says he delights in you. Walk in that. When you walk in the truth that you are honored by God, it's so much easier to be kind to yourself and kind to those around you. Ruth and Naomi were grateful for the chance to glean, and their gleaning led them to even greater things, a new normal. Ruth and Naomi's gleaning did lead them to good things. It led them to Boaz. As you keep reading, you see where they connected with Boaz. We see him take in Ruth and care for Naomi. We see him save them when their lives were turned upside down in a tragic way. When they feel empty, when they could only glean, Boaz redeemed them. In chapter 4, it says, Praise be to the Lord who has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. During that time, a kinsman redeemer meant that they were the person in the family and their family would encompass anyone in their bloodline, but they were the person in their family that really took care of the rest of them. That if something was wrong or they were in need or needed help, they needed saving, they needed redeeming, it was Boaz that would have done that for them. He was their kinsman redeemer. He was the one that made everything okay, really. He had a plan and he went to them and he went to anyone who was in need. Think about who that is in your family. Who's your family's kinsman redeemer? Who checks on you? Who brings you what you need when you're sick? Who sometimes still makes your doctor's appointments? Who prays over you fiercely? Who has your back when you feel alone or picks you up when you need a ride from maybe somewhere you shouldn't have been? Who puts money in your account when you did not schedule it out the way you should have? Who listens while you cry about the words that someone has said to try and demean you? Who is that for you? In my family, sometimes it's my big sister. Sometimes it's my sweet dad. But every time, every day of the week, every moment, that's my mom. She is my kinsman redeemer. She makes us whole when we feel like something has been taken from us. She speaks worth into us when we feel like we don't deserve it. She lets us glean in her field where she has put in the work, 
where she has harvested and taken the time to grow. She walks in kindness and she fills our cup tenfold when we come home empty. Moms are often our kinsmen redeemers, aren't they? But we know that we are called to also be that. But how do we know how to? How do we walk in kindness like some moms and like our kinsmen redeemers? Someone told me once, and they were talking about preaching. It was a professor at SNU. He told us that we are not equipped to preach, (laughs) that we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to stand in the place of God and speak on his word. But we are very called to. This is our calling. So knowing that we're unsure how to and knowing that we don't feel like we have all the right words, but knowing that we have to, you do it anyway. And you are expectant of God to fill in the gap. So knowing that we're called to kindness and knowing that we don't always know the right things to say or the ways to go about it, knowing that we don't know how to and knowing that we must, we try and walk in kindness We try and walk in kindness because we walk with Christ. The only way we understand kindness is to understand Christ. As we continue reading in the story, it says over and over that Boaz had a personal relationship with Christ. You see it in all parts of his life, even when he was just showing up at work. When he was just showing up in his fields and talking with his workers, he would address them and say, "Um, the Lord be with you and bless you. He didn't say this out of habit. He didn't say it because he just felt like it should have been there. Everyone knew in the town that he had a personal relationship with Christ, that he genuinely meant these things. That is how we know what the next right step is. That's how Boaz knew how to show kindness and how to walk in kindness, even though it's not something that always comes easy and not something that we always know how to handle the first time. But sometimes kindness is just letting someone glean from the crop that you have spent the time to grow. Kindness is hard because we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We don't know how to show kindness to people that aren't quarantining the way that we think they should. Maybe we don't know how to be kind in this new normal. I wish there was some kind of blanket statement or phrase that we could say and it would always fill someone with that kindness of Christ, but I don't have that for you. There's really only one way to be certain that we are walking in kindness and showing the kindness of Christ to others, and that's to have a personal relationship with this God of kindness. It's the only way that we know that we're going to make the next right decision. You know what it is. You know how to make that next right decision because you're walking with Christ. Boaz knew it. Naomi knew it. Ruth knew it. Our kinsmen redeemers that we have in our own lives know it. But the only way we have that is to have a personal relationship with this God of kindness. Jonathan Edwards said that there is a difference between having a rational judgment of honey and knowing that it's sweet and having a sense of its sweetness. There's a difference between just hearing about the sweetness of honey or reading about it and trying to make a rational judgment. There's a difference between that and having a first-hand experience in it. Do you only have a rational understanding of the kindness of God? Or do you have a real sense, a personal understanding of this God of kindness? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Do you understand the gospel and the God of the gospel that calls you to live and to walk in kindness? When the Lord has brought you home empty and you're just gleaming, can you lean on this God of kindness because you have a personal first-hand experience with him? Or do you just have a second-hand knowledge of honey? Have you only read of the sweetness and tried to understand? Or do you have a personal in-your-heart relationship with this God of kindness? Can you point to a time in your life that you know that God was present? Can you point to a time in your life where you felt his love and understood his kindness so much so that it filled you and poured out into others? Are you so filled with Christ that you can say you have a personal relationship? Because he stayed with you. He didn't leave you. Even though you might be gleaning and even though you came home empty, God came with you. The God that created you loves you and he did not leave you or forsake you. 
I don't want you to just have a rational understanding of this. I want you to know what honey tastes like. I want you to be able to explain to your friends and your family and those around you what this really means for you. I want you to be so filled with the kindness of Christ that it pours out of you like it did Ruth, like it did Naomi, like it did Boaz, like it did your kinsman redeemer in your life, like it did Christ when he died for you. Have you tasted honey? Have you made the choice to have a personal relationship with this God of kindness? Because if not, he's still here. He is still with you. He never left you. So right now in your home, even if you're in a time of gleaning, even if you feel like the Lord has brought you home empty, make the choice, if you haven't, to get on a personal level with kindness, to begin to walk in kindness with our Lord and Savior, our kinsman, Redeemer. Pray with me. God, this time is not what we expected. This is not how we planned our Mother's Day. This isn't how we planned any of this. God, we were full and you brought us home empty. We feel like we're only gleaning and we don't know what the next right step is. We don't know how to walk in kindness all the time. And if there is someone who doesn't have that firsthand experience, Come to them now to give them the sense of what honey tastes like because you make all the difference. Walk in kindness with us and show us how to follow in your footsteps. It's in your good name that we pray. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. You are blessed and you are dismissed.